we just relay some facts, whether they're new or antique. So just sit back and relax. It's time for What's Up This Week. Hello, and welcome to What's Up This Week, your weekly dose of history, facts, and trivia from University Branch Library. This week, we're looking back at the publication of the so-called Surgeon's Photograph, which purported to be photographic evidence of the Loch Ness Monster, published by the Daily Mail on April 21st, 1934. Supposedly taken by Robert Kenneth Wilson, a London gynecologist, it was reportedly the first photograph of the creature's head and neck. Wilson's refusal to have his name associated with it led to it being known as the surgeon's photograph. According to Wilson, he was looking at the lock when he saw the monster, grabbed his camera, and snapped four photos. Only two exposures came out clearly. The first reportedly shows a small head and back, and the second shows a similar head in a diving position. The first photo became well known, and the second attracted little publicity because of its blurriness. The photograph became the most famous on the subject and was subjected to scientific scrutiny over the ensuing years. Although there were doubts from the outset about its authenticity, no credible explanation about what it depicted was forthcoming until the 1990s. In 1994, barely a month short of the 60th anniversary of the photo, reports confirmed that the photo was fake. Wilson was the frontman for Marmaduke Weatherall, a filmmaker and self-proclaimed big game hunter. According to the story, five men were involved in the 60-year hoax. The other three conspirators were Weatherall's son, Ian, son-in-law, Christian Sperling, and a London insurance broker named Maurice Chambers. This announcement was the result of a reported deathbed confession by the last surviving of the five, Christian Sperling, who died at the age of 90 in 1994. Before dying, Sperling revealed that he had made the monster, which was actually only a foot tall and 18 inches long. He had been ridiculed because of his association with the monster and was motivated by revenge. Wilson had been selected by the group as the front man because he enjoyed a practical joke and because his status as a physician might lend credibility to the story. While the photograph has been confirmed as a fake, Reports of sightings of Nessie date back to the 6th century, and people still look for her today. No animal has ever been confirmed to live in the lock which resembles the mythical monster. Not yet, anyway. That's it for me. What do you have for us this week, James? Well, thank you, Daniel, and hi, everyone. Mr. Clarence Darrow was an extremely skilled lawyer that worked as one during the late 1800s and well into the next century. He was a legend even in his own time. But the cases that made his career and solidified his reputation were as numerous as they were dramatic. Darrow began life on April 18, 1857 in Farmdale, Ohio, yet spent his childhood in Kinsman. He studied law for a year at the University of Michigan and began practicing in his home state in the early 1880s. During the decade's latter half, Darrow found his way to Illinois and later worked as an attorney for the city of Chicago and the Chicago and Northwestern Railway. He first gained fame as a defense lawyer when he represented Eugene V. Debs and other officials of the American Railway Union who were arrested for supporting the disruptive Pullman strike of 1894. Darrow also served in the Illinois House of Representatives from 1903 to 1905. Then in 1911, Darrow went to California to defend the brothers John J. and James B. McNamara. They were labor leaders charged with dynamiting the Los Angeles Times building. The McNamaras pled guilty and their lives were spared. A much older Darrow worked as the defense lawyer in two historical cases the following decade. In 1924, he defended Nathan F. Leopold Jr. and Richard A. Loeb, who admitted to kidnapping and murdering 14-year-old Bobby Franks in an effort to commit a perfect crime. The defense lawyer used psychiatric evidence to claim both teenagers were mentally ill. Darrow's goal was to keep them from receiving the death sentence, and in that, he was successful, though each one did receive a life sentence plus 99 years. Just a year later, Darrow attracted massive attention to another court case. 
The Scopes trial took place in Dayton, Tennessee. That summer, Darrow defended John T. Scopes' right to teach the theory of evolution in public school. Scopes was a coach and substitute biology teacher that violated the Butler Act when he allegedly taught evolution in a high school class. But the situation was largely set up. The town's leaders actually sought out someone to violate the law and get arrested and stand trial. It had less to do with religion and science and more to do with bringing business to Dayton. Well, Scopes was their guy. The media outlets were all a Twitter over the trial, too. William Jennings Bryan, a politician and evangelist, led the prosecution. The judge was John Tate Ralston. It was a dramatic and scandalous event, but for many locals and non-locals, quite engaging too. Indeed, the trial stimulated the town's economy, with many people coming in droves to view the spectacle in person. Unfortunately, Scopes was found guilty in July 1925 and fined $100, but the conviction was ultimately overturned on a technicality. Activist and author Clarence Darrow was an extremely busy, articulate, and educated man that devoted much of his life to the law, with cases that remain controversial. He also left a legacy as persistent as the man himself. To learn more about Clarence Darrow, check out any of these books. All right, Megan, what do you have for the people this week? Hi, everyone. This week's weird thing is that April 22nd is National Jelly Bean Day, a day to celebrate the ever popular bean shaped sugar candies with soft shells and thick gel interiors. Jelly beans are one of the most popular and well recognized candies on the market, and though they've been around for a long time, possibly since the Civil War days, they didn't start to gain popularity until the 1930s when they became associated with Easter celebrations because of their egg-like shape. When you think of jelly beans, you're probably envisioning the Jelly Belly brand, but the company that makes them didn't start out with that name. Gustav Golitz started his candy making company in 1869 and his son Herman followed suit with his own company in 1924, but it wasn't until 1960 that this company started making jelly beans. What sets their jelly beans apart is the natural flavorings on the inside of the bean, not just on the outer coating as all other jelly beans before. Then, in 1976, a candy and nut distributor named David Klein collaborated with the president of the company to make jelly beans with natural purees. This was the birth of the modern Jelly Belly jelly bean that we all know and love. Jelly Belly jelly beans now come in over 50 different varieties. Some of their more interesting flavors include cappuccino, chili mango, eggnog, island punch, toasted marshmallow, tabasco, and mixed berry smoothie. They've also got some really gross and weird flavors like dirty dishwater, spoiled milk, canned dog food, and stinky socks, among others. You can try those at your own risk. If you'd like to learn more about David Klein and the Jelly Belly Candy Company, there's a documentary called Candy Man, available to stream via the Hoopla app, which you can access with your Fort Bend County Library card. Or, if you're interested in making your own candy at home, we can help you out with these candy making books. Place your holds today. Thank you for watching. Join us again next week for more facts and trivia from University Branch Library.